Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for From the Campaign to the Capitol, the first webinar in our series of three designed for newly elected legislators and newly hired legislative staff. As I mentioned, I'm Natalie O'Donnell-Wood, and I work for NCSL's Center for Ethics and Government. Our panel today will spend the next 30 minutes discussing how to move your focus from a campaign mindset to the business of legislating and back again. Our panelists will share their experiences and expertise and also touch on some of the great areas that can confront legislators and staff as you toggle between these two roles. Just a quick order of business, um, if, you could, if attendees could plan to maximize their screen, um, you will see on the left-hand side of your screen a chat function. Note at the bottom there are different options. You can send message to, messages to everyone or to the panelists. If you have a question for our panelists, please select that in the box at the left and type your question in there. We will be taking audience questions at the end of the webinar. Speaking of our panelists, I'm pleased to have with me today Senator Arthur Orr from Alabama. Senator Orr, are you on the line? I am, Natalie. Thank you. Terrific. Welcome. Representative Dan Pabone from Colorado, who I'm fortunate enough to have here in the studio with me. Hello, Natalie. Thanks for having me here today. You're welcome. And Naomi Miller, District Director for Speaker Joe Strauss in Texas. Hi. Naomi, are you there? I am here. Terrific. A little bit about our panelists. Senator Orr was elected to the Alabama Senate in 2006. He's an attorney, a former Peace Corps volunteer, and has served in leadership positions for many boards and organizations. Among his legislative roles, he has served as chair of the Joint Fiscal Committee and has championed government transparency issues in his state. He and his wife have two children, and he has lived in or visited over 60 countries. Representative Dan Pabone is also an attorney, and his legal background has focused on real estate, green building, small business, and northwest Denver neighborhood issues. He was first elected to the Colorado House in 2010 and has served on the Finance, Appropriations, and Legislative Council committees. Prior to his legislative service, he worked for the Obama-Biden presidential transition team, where he helped draft the president's first executive order on transparency and ethics in government. He and his wife have two children. Naomi Miller has worked for the Texas House for five years, serving as district director for Speaker Joe Strauss, who has served as speaker of, um, for the past three legislative sessions. Naomi is in charge of the day-to-day -day responsibilities of the district office, including constituent inquiries and meetings, community outreach, and representing Speaker Strauss at events in his district and around San Antonio. She also provides strategic planning for the district. She is also part of Strauss's campaign team and assisted in primary races in 2012 and 2014. Again, welcome to uh, our distinguished panelists. Thanks so much for being here today to talk about this important topic. So today we're going to discuss actually making the transition from the campaign trail to serving in the Capitol, the actual business of legislating, and what happens when you move back on the trail again. And just so you can put faces to names, and you'll see a few pictures today, um, of our of our panelists in action. So first on making the transition. We'll start with you, Representative Pabone. In addition to your personal legislative experience, you served on a presidential transition team. What tips have you learned along the way to recalibrate and move from a campaign mindset to a legislating mindset? Uh, well, that's a great question. And Natalie, let me just thank you again and the NCSL staff um, and enjoy looking forward to this panel with Senator Orr and, and Naomi as well. Someone um, much wiser and more famous than me said that you campaign in poetry, but you govern in prose. And I think the idea there is that uh, on the campaign trail, there's, there's many lofty ideas and many lofty goals that are thrown out. And then during the governance period, when you're actually a sworn in legislator, you really have to focus on the, the meat and potatoes of your job. And the good news is I think you can use the template that was used during the campaign in many ways for the, as a template for governance. When you set out on your campaign, you said your goal was to win. And if you're on this conference call, you probably did. Congratulations. <laughs> um, now the, you need to have some goal setting for your legislative t tenure. What, what is your definition of success? Um, is it is it you know a certain bill a certain idea that you want to discuss? Do you actually want to pass something into law? 
Are you more concerned with your outreach uh, using your campaign template? You, you had a certain number of people you needed to contact uh, by election day. Is there a no number of constituencies in your district now that you want to contact by the time you finish your first term? Is there a number of uh, town halls that you want to hold? Is there, um, again, uh, a number of bills that you want to introduce? Um, and what's that, the public policy that you want your uh, agenda to look like? It, it, again, it goes from campaign to governance. You can use that same template as a strategy piece uh, to get where you want to be in two years. In other words, I think the best way to transition is where do you want to be two years from now if you're a House member and four years from now if you're a Senate member? And um, what does that look like? What are the steps you need to take in order to accomplish your goals? Thank you, Representative. Senator Orr or Naomi, do you have any thoughts to add on this question? And again, attendees, if you have specific questions for our panelists, uh, we will take those at the end. Senator Orr, during your legislative tenure, Alabama experienced a change in the majority for the first time in decades. When this happens, new leadership is elected and appointed, the minority might feel demoralized, and the majority hasn't had the experience of being in charge. Can you talk about that kind of post-campaign transition? How do you pull together after change and uncertainty to focus on the session? Well, thank you again, as the representative said, for having us on, and I hope this is um, practical help for your uh, listeners. A couple things, I, you know, and I'll, I'll focus more on the, the practical things that I've done, which doesn't mean they're any better, any worse uh, than what others do, but they're things that I do here locally. Um, one of the things transitioning out of the campaign mode, and this is certainly, uh, we don't, People don't uh, advise using newspaper ads, but I usually, if I've got leftover campaign money, take out a full-page ad in the weeklies or the daily newspapers um, around the district as, as funds allow, and uh, have a basically a thank you, and that I'm here to serve uh, any and all in the district, and uh, certainly my contact information is there, but it's more of a transition type piece that you know, now that the shooting's over, it's uh, time to move forward and, and I'm available and, and open to your comments, concerns, criticisms, insights, whatever they may be from the constituency out there. Another thing I would kind of recommend is, you know, you folks have a, um, usually have an email list when it came from uh, you know, through the campaign or Facebook pages, and stay. but try to accumulate those uh, contacts, either email list or, or Facebook friends, and um, establish a database to start using to communicate with the constituency, and then certainly have a way that others that want to join in afterwards, and they may be from the opposite party or you know different political viewpoints than those supporting your campaign, but uh, try to make it as broad as you can as a way to communicate with the um, constituents. So um, again, I think in the transition for me, it, it's more about uh, trying to move from, like you said, the campaign into an accessibility situation and, and that you're going to be accessible to all in the district to uh, represent them in the capital. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Naomi, do you have anything to add on that point, or Representative Pabone? Naomi, you want to chime in here? I, I have some ideas, yeah. but I, I want to give you an opportunity. Well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, thank you, Natalie, for letting me be the voice uh, on the staff side. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity. Um, as the five years that I've been here, Texas has been a red state, and of course, longer than that. And so, um, you know, I still think it's important to be a gracious winner, no matter what the makeup is of the majority of your district or the majority um, in the House and the Senate. Um, we have to represent everyone in our district, not just the, just not just the uh, the majority. And I feel like reaching across the aisle and respecting everyone's views is very important. And I would just say this: I mean, inside the, again, moving from campaign to uh, governance. I mean, your relationships inside the Capitol are going to be so critical to your success over the course of your um, legislative tenure. And so 
um, not just saying it to your constituents or saying it, um, but actually doing it. Um, what I've done is I, I generally have sent out personalized holiday cards uh, because it is the time of year to, uh, you know, obviously do that and send them to your, to your new colleagues. And just as a gesture of saying, I'm looking forward to working together um, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm very excited about this next session. Because, one, not a lot of people do that, but, two, um, you know, in a genuine way, I think it really says I, I'm willing, you know, there's no good uh, Democratic ideas or good Republican ideas or bad on the other side. It's I'm willing to listen to any idea from any side. And I think as a practical matter, um, if you're in the, you know, if you're in the minority, you definitely have to do that. And if you're in the majority, um, you certainly are going to have situations where there's going to be nonpartisan or bipartisan situations where it's not a, you know, a, a value bill, it's a, you know, a, a business bill or whatever it may be, and you're going to need support from either side of the aisle. Trying to do that early on and now before everyone gets so in the heat of, of the legislative session is going to be critical to helping your success in, during, the, during the year. Naomi, you have such a unique – I'm sorry, go ahead, Senator. Well, I was I was just going to add um, one other thing, you know, that, in, again, just throwing out practical suggestions. Uh, you talk about, the Representative Pabone talked about the, um, you know, the Christmas cards, which is certainly a good thing to do as far as his colleagues. One thing, you know, even though Alabama is a red state, there still um, are a lot of local Democratic office holders, and those people are very important, and they may need you down in the legislature, and as well as you need them back home. So, I always make it a, a, a habit of sending out a letter to newly elected office holders um, that have been elected, and giving my personal cell, personal email, and and that private contact information and certainly wishing them well in their job and if there's anything I can do for them. But also um, candidates that ran both on the Democratic side and the uh, Republican side, just thanking them for uh, putting uh, their name on the ballot and going through that process of, um, through the election process, which can be quite trying at times. Um, for anybody who's run for public office, so uh, thanking them for their uh, willingness to participate in the process, and you know, of course, offering if I can ever do anything or listen to them, if they have any concerns or anything. Certainly, the door is always open. Thank you, Senator Naomi. You have such a unique job in that you are in the district uh, frequently, in day in and day out, and very accessible to the speaker's constituents. Can you speak about what staff can specifically do? to um, represent people that you know didn't vote for your boss, or have you ever been in a situation where you were sort of confronted on that and how you had to kind of smooth the path forward? Well, and it's very rare in my official capacity that if I have some a constituent on the line or I'm at a community meeting and someone's standing in front of me, it's very rare that you're going to know whether or not they voted for you. Mm -hmm. So I try to just keep an even keel and just always – um, treat everybody the same. And, of course, some of them are, may tell you they didn't vote for you or may tell you the, about their differences with, with your candidate. And, of course, when I'm on the campaign trail, that's when it's a little more obvious. But I really try to approach everyone who lives in our district the same way, including our opponent, because at the end of the day, our opponent lives about a mile from my office. I see him at HEB. He lives not very far from me. I live I live in the district. And, I'm, and, and at the end of at the end of the day, the day after the election, if he needs help from his state representative, I need to make sure that I'm available to him and not, you know, hold anything against anyone who has a difference uh, with uh, what the speaker represents. And um, that's the beauty of democracy. You can vote for whoever you want, but it doesn't mean that you should be represented differently if the person you voted for doesn't win. So I just try to approach everybody the same way and know that my – official job, which is 365 days a year, um, is to represent them no matter if they voted for the speaker or not. And I kind of remind that of the rest of the campaign staff. I feel I'm a little bit unique because I'm, you know, at the day after the election, the campaign staff kind of is kind of off, but I'm back on as, as his district director, and I have to deal with everyone who voted for us and who didn't vote for us. And so I always try to remind folks we need to treat everyone with respect, and that includes our opponent. Well said. Thank you, Naomi. 
switching gears slightly to actually talk about the business of legislating. Senator Orr, the first question goes to you. Being a legislator means you serve many different constituencies. Do you ever struggle with questions over who you represent? Do you feel tugged between representing your district or your caucus, the institution, or even your own principles? Well, I, again, I think uh, the, the focus at the end of the day needs to be on the people in the district of you know all um, political leanings or whatever. Uh, those are the people that you are sent to represent. The um, you know, it, it, it you've got to hear all sides, and as you know, the representative said earlier, um, he's certainly open to folks that uh, may be in the other party or, or no party at all, or whatever the case may be. And w what you'll find is a new legislature legislator that um, a lot of people that uh, you think have, have perhaps preconceived notions about um, what their position is going to be on. Uh, the various issues, um, it really is healthy to hear their point of view, and and many times it'll have you you know thinking twice or, or understanding better, and having a better aptitude for the various issues that that you'll face. So, you know my 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 encouragement would be just to listen. The second thing is um, you mentioned the word caucus, and uh, you know I sometimes can be a little bit of a um, um, challenge, I guess, to even though I'm in our Senate leadership, um, there have been issues where I just divide and say this is not for my district and it's not in the best interest of my district. And though the leadership and others may want to go a different direction, um, very courteous about it and very sincere. But um, you know, you, you at the end of the day, you need to uh, make sure that you're representing your people back home and not necessarily what leadership has decided or what the party has decided or others, uh, an association or a lobbying group. It is um, it is about the people back home. Thank you, Senator. Just a really quick follow-up. Do you feel that, have you, um, did it take some time and tenure to, to feel that way or to be able to make that stance? Is that something that a new legislator can easily do right away, do you think? Well, this, <laughs> this is going to, uh, uh, you know, take it to a different level. But you know, my encouragement would be, and it's 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 difficult to do, and I certainly understand that. But the um, not do, don't worry about your political future. <laughs> worry about you know representing your district and the people who sent you there, and you'll find that most things will take care of themselves. Um, if you're representing your and, and working your district, um, they'll take care of you. And uh, don't get swept up in the arm twisting and the, the pressure of certain votes. You have to vote with us. Um, now, there may be a cost to pay when it comes in the speaker. <laughs> Naomi may, when the speaker uh, says that we have to have you on this vote. But uh, if you're solid on your principles and, and, the, and the leanings of your district, um, your speaker, your your pro Senate pro tem, or whomever the the leader is, or the, will understand that your district sees things differently than perhaps the party does or the leadership does. Well, and I think one of the ways that a new legislator could approach um, pressures from leadership, um, and I'm the speaker pro tem, so I understand uh, both sides of this. Uh, you have to. Um, indicate if there's something that's truly against your conscience. Because I think the, the, the philosophy we take um, anyway in Colorado is we use the three C's in this order. Is a bill going to violate our conscience? Is it going to violate our constituency? And then will it violate our caucus? And I think if you, you know, at the outset you say that, you know, I, I know where my, my caucus is at, I know where my constituency is at, but this violates my personal belief system and you can take that to your leadership or your constituents and say, I'm just, you know, it is, I can't, I won't be able to sleep at night with a vote on this. I think people may disagree with you, but they're going to respect you, especially if you can explain why it's against your personal conscience. So, you know, again, I think you have to decide which, on which hills you're going to die. Uh, but, you know, the conscience piece is a, a very important one and fundamental to who you are and very personal. And it should be relatively easy to explain 
uh, that decision. And if you can't, maybe it's not against your personal conscience, or maybe there's other factors that you need to be, that you're thinking about, as Senator Orr said, that may not be an appropriate calculation in making decisions about about what you're going to do. Naomi, the next question goes to you, and feel free to add in on that last question as well. Um, we've touched on this a little bit, but how do you approach relationship building with all the various uh, new and old relationships with which you need to build? New members, new staff, new leadership, those across the aisle. Any thoughts on that? Just, you know, approach it with an open mind. You try to find common ground on issues. You know, everybody is passionate about public school finance, about transportation, about things. I mean, it doesn't matter what part of the aisle you're on. Um, you just find common ground and respect each other's views and be, you know, if they're new, you just offer to be helpful. And um, locally, we, we uh, locally, of course, I work mostly with the folks in San Antonio. We have 10, 10 members of the legislature here in San Antonio, and we have a new one coming in, and I, you know, helped him meet some stakeholders here and told him to have his staff call me with even the smallest question. Um, and I, I think that if you develop that relationship with them, it's it's best for you because in, in the end, if if you need them as an ally um, on a, of course this is different because we're the speaker's office, but you know if you you know just making them your ally by being helpful and uh, finding common ground is is the way that I approach it. Representative Pabon, any thoughts on that question? You know, I mean, I I think um, ultimately. Um, You've got to. It kind of goes back to your own personal goals um, and what you want to accomplish, um, and you know, sort of where um, you find um, you know commonality or camaraderie with with folks inside the, the legislature that you may not have ar have already discovered. Um, and spending time um, to taking the time to do that is is going to pay dividends and rewards that that you can't even imagine right now. Senator Orr, any thoughts on the relationship building piece? No, I think they've said it all. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I don't want us to exceed our time, so I'll, 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 <laughs> I'll, I'll say you. ditto. Okay. <laughs> Representative Pabon, if you made promises on the campaign trail, how do you keep them? And if you can't, how do you communicate this with your constituents? Do you ever worry about seeming inconsistent? Well, I mean, I, 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 mean, I think – all of us are aware of the stereotypes of politicians making promises and then not being able to deliver on them. And I think, um, again, if you're campaigning in poetry and then governing in prose, that could very well happen. One of, one of the things I did when I was a freshman legislator, and I still actually try to do it now, is invite my constituents to come and observe the process, be a part of a committee hearing, help even to you know, be part of the bill drafting or concept drafting process and allow them to sort of watch the process play out, and whether it's success or failure, um, in addition to you telling your, your audience why things did or didn't pass, they can be third-party validators for that experience and really help to bolster uh, your uh, credibility either way. And I think um, it's, it's a very valuable tool, especially if you're engaging in legislation that you know, is either controversial or very specific to your district that might not have great cross appeal, but it's still important for you to put, to put uh, you know, your stake in the ground and, and put a record out there to show that you're uh, representing your constituency, involving um, your, your constituents. And again, it's going to be a very small amount of people who are actually going to be involved, no doubt. Normal people don't go to the Capitol and spend time in bill <laughs> hearings and drafting. We, are, we, know, we all know that. But but to engage as many as you can in that process, I think would, would really help to explain the promises you know made, promises kept or not. Um, and again, I think after your first year uh, or a couple of years in the legislature, you're going to be cognizant on your reelection, and I know we're going to talk about that next, uh, about what promises, how how specific you can be in the promises you make uh, in order to keep your word. And again, I think as long as you're communicative with your constituents and you're genuine about why things did or didn't happen, why you took your vote or why yes or no vote, and you have a reasonable, articulate explanation for your position, no one is, they might disagree with you, but they will still respect you for what you've done. 
Senator Orr, do you have any thoughts on this, or is this, have you ever run into this in your, during your time in the legislature? Well, I, I do know this, keep your promises, because it will certainly come back and haunt you if you start uh, equivocating or, you know, things that you've said on the campaign trail um, that you now wish you hadn't, but you need to live with them. And um, if you do change your mind, I mean, it is better to own it and uh, fess up or whatever that you've changed your mind rather than trying to dance around it and pre pretend it doesn't exist or didn't exist. Now, Naomi, please. any thoughts? Yeah, go, please. Yeah, I think I think that it, it's very important, obviously, to be honest, but sometimes circumstances change, and sometimes some of the things that you've promised, um, if the budget, if something happens with the budget or the economy, and it, that's just one example, if circumstances change, um, you just have to explain those circumstances and just always be honest. Thank you. Moving to the next um, section, what happens when you go back on the road or trail again? Naomi, the first question is for you. Do you ever, do you feel like you are never really done campaigning? And how do you decide as a staffer when to take your public hat off and put your candidate hat or, you know, representing your boss, put that hat back on? Well, I think that if you do, um, if you do your job well and you represent your constituents well and you're visible and you're active in your district, the campaigning kind of does itself, even when you're um, not in an election cycle. Um, if you if you lay that groundwork and that foundation when the election actually comes up on you, you just kind of go out and reinforce that and say, you know, it was great to see you a couple months ago, but I'm back on the ballot, and um, you know, remind them what uh, that they need to get out and vote. And if you've laid that groundwork uh, during the the non-election cycle. The campaigning kind of does itself. That's kind of how I feel. It's really easy to get out there and and remind folks to vote if if you've been visible the whole time. So I kind of feel like you're yes, you are campaigning all the time, um, but uh, I feel like it, it kind of gets done itself even when I'm in my official capacity because we are visible and uh, we are constantly working for our constituents and the folks that are ultimately going to vote uh, for Speaker Strauss. So. Um, I feel like I'm always wearing both hats, um, and like I said, if you have that mindset, 365 days a year, you won't have a problem get, getting reelected if you've if you've represented the folks that are going to vote for you well. What I like about this picture of you, Naomi, is amidst all those signs, you are visible. You are the one that's, uh, that's out there uh, being seen. So it was I a like hot day. <laughs> Uh, Senator Orr, do you have any thoughts on the endless campaign cycle or the perception that it's an endless campaign cycle? Well, I, I, I would just echo what uh, Naomi said. You're, if you're working hard and out there among your constituents and doing um, things for them and listening, uh, then you know, call it campaigning, call it what you will, but it's doing your job. And if you are doing your job well uh, and actively during the non-campaign years, the people will reward you. I, I certainly believe, and in, um, in the next time, it's, it's time for an election. Representative, any I see you not. He's nodding. For those of you that can't see what I see. <laughs> so um, I'm a big believer that good policy makes good politics. And so if you again are, are promoting the ideas that reflect not only your district, but, you know, the, the values of your state that you represent, and those are going to obviously differ depending on where you're from and where you live, um, that, that you will have, you know, some good success in, in your election cycle. And, and, you know, we're all engaged in a political environment. There's, there's no doubt about that. And to, and to pretend that we're not, I think, is, is you know, Pollyannish at, at best and just foolish at worst. Uh, because to to govern um, without being cognizant of the ramifications in the next election cycle puts you out of touch with with your leadership, puts you out of touch with your fundraising capabilities, and that that's part and parcel of of what we do. So it's kind of coming full circle. Um, but but ultimately, if you know the policies that you present, and and I've seen such a shift uh, over my tenure from constantly waiting for Congress to act and do things of substance and, and, uh, and, and new innovation to watching the states uh, actually engage in, in dramatic and landscape-changing public policy in a way that there's now state models that are passed 
from state to state, starting in, in an individual state, and it's and it's and it's pretty exciting. So so there's no reason why your good policy can't be innovative, exciting, um, substantive, reflect your state's values, and still ultimately play into the larger picture of your role uh, when you go back to the campaign trail. Thank you. And this next question is for you, Representative. Can you describe uh, how a campaign for re-election is different from a first legislative campaign? Absolutely. Um, you know, for those of you who are on this line, uh, on this line who went through primaries uh, to get where you're at, I mean, unless you've done something completely off uh, off the rails, you're probably not going to have a primary your second time around. Um, for those of you who have been um, incumbent or who are not incumbents because you're all first year, but who are in competitive districts. Uh, you're going to, you know, have the incumbency rule in your favor. And if you've done your outreach and your town halls and your calls um, the way that I described initially, there's probably a lot more people who are going to know who you are than you ever uh, had in your first campaign. You'll also have a record, of course, and that's, again, the good policy makes good politics uh, solution. So if you have a strong record behind you, you've done your, your work in the community and constituency and haven't forgot who brought you to office, uh, it is a fundamentally different campaign. It's amazing how much less time you spend begging for money and hoping for, for, for campaign contributions on the front end. And on the second round, again, with your record and whatnot, you'll have, you'll have um, opportunities to fundraise in ways that you hadn't before. Um, and maybe you've lost some support. And, and again, that's part of the political process. So, it is fundamentally different with the incumbency and, and a record, um, but it's also, I think, more exciting and more uh, opportunity to make public policy because now you actually have an opportunity to think in advance of the next legislative session what you're going to do, do the outreach to the stakeholders you need to do, and you're going to have that much more success in your next legislative session. Thank you. Naomi, do you have any thoughts on this question from a staff point of view? You know, it's. It, I guess I, I've never, when I worked, when I started working for the speaker, he was already elected. So I've never worked in a first campaign for a, a newly elected office holder. But I assume that it's it's just what you've, what you would do versus what you've what you've done, and it's it's working mm -hmm. with, you know, you're working on a record that you've built, um, and um, to me, I guess that's what would be the difference between your first legislative campaign and then the, the you know the ones that follow is is uh, promises versus your actual record that's in stone senator any thoughts on this question uh i i just say the same as re representative usually you won't have a primary uh, in the second round um if you've done your job well and um mm -hmm. so that that can be a, a big difference mhm mm and, um, next question for you, Senator Orr, who or where do you turn to for guidance when you aren't sure about what is inappropriate or appropriate can, uh, activity? So in other words, you know, sometimes it can be difficult to know when to fundraise or when to, um, you know, put your legislative hat back on and take it off again to be on the campaign trail. Are there good tips for newly elected legislators about how to walk the line between uh, legislating and campaigning? Well, I would I would assume you know having gone through a campaign, they're they're familiar now uh, as far as the campaign finance laws of the various state you know their particular state is uh, you know that that they're familiar with that law and um, and and are well versed in it. So making that transition to an office holder, uh, you may find yourself uh, having to call your ethics commissioner is our title here. Um, for example, you know they're they're pretty open uh, to just needing advice and guidance. So don't be you don't feel inhibited by you know contacting them. It's not like um, you've done anything wrong. For example, uh, I remember a couple. It's happened a couple times, but we as you recruit um, economic development prospects and businesses, a lot of them uh, happen to be foreign, and so you know you'll be dealing with people, you know, not from our culture, and they'll present you with a gift uh, many times, and it'll exceed the, the allowed value. And, you know, I 
call to the ethics commissioner, what do I do? I didn't want to give it back in the ceremony and be rude, the rude, Amer ugly American. But, um, you know, what do I do with this gift? Uh, you know, do I keep it or what, you know, or do I donate it to charity or, you know, what, what, you know, so there's several options to work through these type things. You know, in my case, I ended up writing uh, checks to um, our state general fund, which needs all the money, got them appraised and uh, wrote it to the state, but, you know, under advice of the ethics commissioner. But, um, you know, donating to charity has also occurred. So there's, there are various things you can do, but they are there to help you not play got you. But um, mm -hmm. if you find yourself in a situation that just you sense uh, something um, you may not it may not be kosher uh, quickly seek counsel and the sooner the better thank you Naomi any thoughts on that I, I completely agree with what he said we mm -hmm. turn to our Texas Ethics Commission just for mm -hmm. the rules and um, just always be mindful of it you know I actually use my mom as a good test on whether things are ethically appropriate or not. And I just say, you know, because she's not involved in politics, she's just a normal person. Um, and I just say, hey, what would you think if, you know, I did this or I did that? And 99.9% .9 of the time, I'll check with ex ethics counsel, no doubt, but their opinions are exactly the same. <laughs> so having someone, or I, and I say that, I, I, I'm not kidding, by the way, but I say that like having someone around you who, you know, is not involved in, in the, you know, day-to-day -day politics or the legislating, someone you can just bounce ideas off of, and it's not even just about ethical behavior, it's just generally, you know, legislative policy. If you can't explain to your mom or your spouse or, or your kids in, in 60 seconds or less what you're doing uh, in the legislature, you, you probably need to decide if that's, one, the right message you're sending, or two, if that's the right policy you're making. Um, because ultimately that's, you know, what people hear on the news or in the newspaper. And so just having someone around you who you can bounce ideas off of um, is always helpful, no matter what the subject area is. Thank you. We're at the 1140 mark, um, so I will, I'm just going to, while I wait for any um, attendee questions to come through, speaking of resources, I'll just mention here that NCSL is your resource. We are an organization made up of legislators and legislative staff. We exist uh, to help you, be it policy research, networking opportunities, or providing the state's perspective at the federal level. That's our job here at NCSL, so please contact us. Um, you know, speaking as somebody who works for our ethics center here at NCSL, we have 50 state information on laws and rules um, when it comes to ethics and lobbying, but we also do training on value-based ethics, and I want to thank our panelists for touching on some of those ethical values that help guide legislators in decision making where there is no black or white uh, uh, guidance. Things like being genuine, being honest, respectful, being fair and consistent. So you guys um, just did a great job highlighting some of the, only skimming the surface really of what it takes to um, bounce back and forth between the campaign trail and working in the Capitol. I'm not seeing any uh, uh, questions come through from our attendees, and even though I feel like I could spend another hour talking to our panel, I will wrap up. Thank you, Senator Orr, Representative Fabone, and Naomi for your time and for sharing your insight today. Um, a note for our attendees, this webinar has been recorded. The archive will be available on NCSL's website, so feel free to share with your colleagues. And make sure to mark your calendars for the next webinar, Wise Women, which is taking place on Friday, January 8th, and our final webinar in the series, What I Wish I Knew, which happens on Friday, January 16th, both at 11 a.m. Mountain Time. Have a great rest of your day, and thank you. Thanks, Natalie.